Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your hosts, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hello. It's season three, episode nine. Uh, we're moving right along into the running back prospects. This is the first position where we could probably say there's definitely going to be at least uh, one player addressed at this position in the draft, Austin. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be a running back taken in the draft. There's uh, the, the value of running backs has certainly diminished over the years, but uh, with everything going on with Love Bell that we already know about, uh, along with the uncertainty of James Conner behind him, we've got a uh, quite an interesting situation on our hands. So, what exactly do the Steelers have at the running back position? Uh, the Steelers have a pretty good backfield, but not for long. This will be the last season with Le'Veon Bell, and that's a huge loss. It's actually probably a bigger loss for the passing game than anything, as he's so good in pass protection as well as a pass catcher when his rushing is was just decent. He's still a great running back, though, and for uh, this year he's a Pittsburgh Steelers He's going to have a good year, at least as a pass catcher. I hope he steps it up and doesn't have a slow start again, but he is missing camp again as of right now, so we will see. After him, it is James Conner, and he didn't really see much playing time as, as uh, Bell was an every-down uh, back, but when he came in, he was a solid change of pace back, and I feel like every time he did come in, he had a 9- or 10-yard gain on one of his, uh, on one of his plays, so I like him. As for Ridley, Ridley also impressed me when he was brought in. He only got to play two games, but I think he did solid and is good running back three. As for Toussaint, he is a good running back three as well and offers special teams value with his kick return abilities. Uh, after that, as far as running backs go, James, Sonner, James Summers is the last, and uh, he's going to be gone by the roster cut down. And that leaves, uh, for backs, uh, fullback Roosevelt Nix. Roosevelt Nix has been amazing for the Steelers. He's a great blocker. He's a key uh, special teams contributor, and I think he really helps Le'Veon Bell's game in the rushing game, even though I just said it wasn't uh, it wasn't that great this past season. If, it, if without Roosevelt Nix, it would have been even worse, probably, because he's such a good uh, blocker for Le'Veon Bell. But uh, that's what I think of the Steelers running back group going into next season. What do you think of them? The Steelers have question marks here. Uh, starting with the ongoing saga of Vell, as we already know, he, he got the franchise tag again, but it's uncertain uh, as far as when he's going to sign it and if he's really going to go all out once he does. Last year, Bell waited until the week before the season started to sign the tag, and he was noticeably slow out of the gate to start the season. He got going more after the first month of the season, but he never really broke off big plays that often, which he never has been uh, the kind of player to do so, but... It was so few and far between last year. Only four runs of 20 or more yards. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if that was the start of him kind of slowing down or if that was just kind of a career aberration uh, in his uh, career. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it continues uh, further, like I said. Uh, but knowing how unpredictable Bell is as far as what he's saying and versus what he's doing, it's quite possible, I think, that he may decide to sit out a few games this year, even if that's not the smart thing to do. Uh, so in case he does this, you know, how does the rest of the position group look? And it could look better. Uh, I will say that much. It's not terrible, though. But since Bell already gets a ton of touches every year, there aren't many other touches to go around for everyone else. Uh, Stephen Ridley, as you said, played well at the end of the season when called upon, and James Conner was okay. Uh, but he is coming off an injury, and Ridley didn't have any significant playing time in the league since 2012. So... He's kind of unproven at this point, too. And Fitzgerald Toussaint is a good special teams player, as we know, and a good pass protector. But he doesn't run or catch the ball very well. And uh, he just he just doesn't offer too much as a runner right now. Uh, so if Bell has to miss significant time or ends up missing significant time, there's going to be questions as to whether or not this group can produce in his absence. Uh, the practice squad player, Summers, he's a pot potential special teams player and camp body to me at this time. Uh, not much more to say on that. And then Roosevelt Nix, as you said, had another good year in 2017. Probably was not utilized in some games as much as he could or should have been, but he still had a good year and he capped it off with his first two career touchdowns. So he's a great blocker and a decent receiver, and hopefully we see a little bit more of him next year. 
There was only one free agent at the running back position this past year, and as we already mentioned, it was Steven Ridley. He was just re-signed on a one-year deal. No uh, details have been released as of yet. But uh, do you like the move? Uh, I like what signing uh, Steven Ridley back. I think he did decent in this two games, so yes, I do. Do you? It definitely doesn't hurt having another capable player around when you aren't sure if Bell's going to be around. So I think that's, I think that was a smart move for them. So now that they've picked up Ridley, I think it's pretty clear there's no other player that you even need to bother looking at in free agency here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's no one left. In the draft, though, I think you'll agree with me. It's a completely different story. There's a ton of different players that could be an impact, uh, that could make an impact for the Steelers, whether it be this year as a potential replacement or next year. And there's the Steelers could really go anywhere here, couldn't they? Yeah, someone's going to have to be brought in to replace Le'Veon Bell, whether it be this year or next year. They could theoretically take a guy early and or take a guy late to start a committee at backs or after Bell leaves. Regardless of where the guy's taken, it, it's pretty much a need. It will bolster the running back course by adding another young back behind James Conner. All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you. Uh, we, we all know Bell is going to be gone next year, and there's two ways to replace running backs nowadays. You can draft a star early on and make him the workhorse like the Steelers have done with Bell in 2013. You can try to find a superstar to replace, uh, you know, a superstar, kind of like what uh, Todd Gurley did in uh, L.A. for the Rams. And uh, just another example being Leonard Fournette this past season for the Jaguars. So that's an option. And then another has been the by committee approach, which the Steelers tried doing in the uh, before they had Bell. It didn't work out too well with Jonathan Dwyer, Isaac Redman, Richard Mendenhall, and a couple other players. But it could be a little different now that it's been some time. The Steelers might be a little better at evaluating running backs. I'd be interested to see how the Steelers could assemble a back by committee approach. I mean, right now, there's still at least one and maybe two pieces away from having a successful committee. But I, I'm going to be honest, I'm kind of interested with what Connor provides as a change of pace and downhill runner. I don't know if Ridley or Toussaint could be a part of that either, but I think the one posi- or the one type of running back that needs to be added is a third down specialist, whether it be a receiver or a pass protecting specialist. But I've been a fan of the by committee approach for a while now, and I think even if they add a, a secondary part of that committee group, I think that's still an important thing for the Steelers to do, and I'd consider that a win if they could pick one up. So, that being said, assume the Steelers uh, have to go early. What's the back that we've all heard about uh, from LSU? I know you looked at him. Uh, the first one up is Darius Geis from LSU, as you said. He's 5'10", 212 pounds. Geis grew up no knowing he was going to LSU since the age of five. And his father was unfortunately murdered when he was only five years old. And the last thing he remembered telling him was that he was going to play at LSU. And thus, the child out of uh, Baton Rouge began his uh, journey to play at LSU from that point forward. He, he, was, uh, he achieved his goal and had big shoes to fill coming into the 2017 season as he had his first chance as a true starter. He had to step up after LSU lost top prospect Leonard Fournette to the NFL. However, it wasn't exactly a question how he would reform in the starting role. Due to Fournette's injuries back in 2016, LSU had already gotten to test out guys and knew he could handle the job. He was actually exceptional. In just six games played, uh, he led the SEC in rushing with 1,387 yards and rushing touchdowns with 15. He also set a team record when he put up 285 yards against Texas A&M, and his 7.6 yards per carry was the fifth best across the nation. In 2017, he was a bit injured himself, though, but he still played 11 of 12 games, receiving second-team All-SEC status after rushing for 1,251 yards, 11 rushing touchdowns, having 18 receptions for 124 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, Geis has also produced as a kick returner at LSU, getting 472 yards on 20 attempts in 2015 and then 223 yards on 11 tries in 2016. So Geis has a lot of positives to him, the, one of the most out of any of the prospects I've looked at so far. Firstly, Geis has a great combination of speed, power, and balance to be able to rush all over defenders. Then he also has a great build for a uh, running back, putting together a powerful lower body with good overall size, making him unstoppable. Then he's also got some pretty great footwork and athleticism to spin out of tackles and create op- opportunities for himself to get more yards. Really, he's just fa- 
fantastic at the con- contact because of his balance and power to resist hits that he uses to punish second-level tacklers. Next, he has a really good sense and vision, recognizing trouble early in the rep based on the defense's penetration, and then making alterations to get past it by using sudden cuts at full speed. Speaking of those cuts, he can gather weight quickly after them and reestablish his base. Uh, Geis is just too difficult to tackle for most defenders. He will push a pile with all his mind, and angle tacklers won't be able to get him down. Trying to tackle him doesn't even matter in some cases, as he possesses that home run uh, capability when he gets into uh, some space. Lastly, he knows uh, how to wait for his blockers uh, to let plays develop, and fo- he follows them nicely. So on the other side of the thing, the biggest concern with Geis to me at least, is that he dealt with a reoccurring injury in 2017 that halted some of his production. Going along with that, he takes a good amount of big hits that have probably worn down on his body, and he also needs to learn to drop his pad level at impact rather than just ducking the helmet into contact as he's just setting himself up for more injury. Another problem I personally have is is he hasn't really been used much as a receiver. He only had 18 catches on the year, and that's not necessarily his fault, but today I worry about his chances of receiving back in the NFL. Uh, I couldn't really find anything about people talking about his hand, so I, I really just think he's just average. But uh, next up is his uh, acceleration. His burst is really also just average, and this may cause him to lose races around the edge when at the pro level. In the pros, he's probably not going to be useful in pass protection at all, which is bad if Geist wants to be an every down back. Then finally, the smallest concern for, for me is Anos has said he needs to be more decisive through the line of scrimmage. But I remember them saying that about a guy in the 2013 draft, and I think his run style worked out fine. Not that ha- uh, not that that's how Geis runs, but that trait doesn't concern me. The uh, hesitating at the line is not something a Steelers fan should worry about as a running back, really. Uh, but uh, if he didn't suffer that injury in the 2017 season, Geis would be guaranteed to be going very early in the first round. But really, scouts are relying on his 2016 tape as. An LSU assistant coach said he wasn't back to full speed until the bowl game he played, but that he will return to the player he was in 2016. Betting on how a player was two years ago is a tough sell for most uh, NFL teams, but somehow I do believe guys will work out. Despite seemingly not being that great of a pass-catching running back in his injury history, guys will probably end up going at the end of the first round or beginning of the second, if if I were to take a guess. His injury is really the only thing holding him out of going in the first. Had he not suffered it, uh, he would have probably gone in the top half of the first round somewhere after Barkley. But that is my first prospect, and that is Darius Geis out of LSU again. So who is your first prospect? First prospect I looked at is, uh, just to forewarn you guys, the running backs I looked at are mostly scat back kind of guys because those are the guys I think the Steelers will take, and I'm hoping they will take. The first one as is... Uh, that I will get to is Akram Wadley from Iowa. Uh, he's only five foot ten and one hundred ninety four pounds. He is an elusive and lean runner. Uh, Wadley's best known for his ability to sidestep defenders in the hole while using his straight line speed to break off bigger runs. After being used sparingly his redshirt fres- freshman season, he made a name for himself in twenty fifteen as a change of pace back, scoring eight total touchdowns, seven of them on the ground and totaling 496 rushing yards in just three starts. Uh, despite only playing, or sorry, starting in only one game in 2016, he actually put up crazy numbers. He rushed for 1,081 yards and scored 10 touchdowns on just 168 carries, while also catching 36 passes for 315 yards and catching three more touchdowns. That got him third-team All-Big Ten honors in uh, 2016, and last year he matched his touchdown total on the ground Uh, and through the air while also rushing for a career-high 1,109 yards, earning him more accolades uh, as another third uh, All-Big Ten honor. So, Wadley is a fantastic athlete. Uh, He has quick feet, and he knows how to use them to his advantage. Uh, He has the ability to stack moves together using a juke, spin, and other elusive moves to his advantage. He spent a lot of time in the open field at Iowa, and it shows as he's a great improvisational player there. Uh, His footwork in tight quarters has drawn comparisons to that of soccer stars and their elusiveness with the soccer ball. Wadley is very agile and uh, can accelerate very quickly after changing directions. This helps because if he needs to outrun defenders to the boundary, he can. Uh, His speed and elusiveness makes him a threat to break long scores on both running and passing plays where he would take uh, angle routes to the house. 
Uh, he's also been split out wide before, too, so he can play in the slot, too. And he's not afraid to leap at the goal line to pick up a touchdown. And although he wasn't always committed to pass protection at Iowa, he showed that when he was, he could do it pretty well. On the flip side, things that uh, Wadley didn't do very well and problems that he had, uh, obviously you're not going to escape his size. He's thin and has a weaker lower body, which is going to turn some teams off from him, and he doesn't have the frame of a desired every down back. This means he's going to struggle to push the pile, too. His vision and patience are kind of what you would describe as the polar opposite of the spectrum compared to Love Bell. Sometimes he moves his feet too quickly and it gets him gets his own feet tangled up if there isn't a clear hole for him. It's like he panics. Uh, if there's a play in front of him to make, he'll take the hole, but he's not a great decision maker if there isn't much running room or if there's multiple holes to take. He doesn't lower his pads at all either, making it easy to push him off, uh, push him out of the running lane or knock him down too, especially considering the fact that he's undersized and his leg strength won't allow him to, you know, reset himself. His route running and consistency of effort and pass protection, as I mentioned before, needs improvement, but his versatility and pass catching ability should give him a chance on some rosters, but it will take time for that to develop. Um, if he can become more of a consistent route runner and uh, pass protector, he might be a good fit as a third down back, but he's not there just yet. So bottom line for Wadley, he's a fantastic athlete with a fantastic highlight reel full of elusiveness and agility on display, and he produced a lot in one of the best conferences in college football. But again, questions about his consistency as a route runner, uh, his lack of decisiveness and his small frame will keep him from being an early uh, round pick uh, in the NFL draft. Most mock drafts have him being taken in the mid rounds. I'm hoping there's a chance he falls back because he's the guy I really want Pittsburgh to pick up this year because I think he can be a good third down back in, in time. So uh, that's the guy I really was interested in. Uh, what's another name at running back Steelers fans should be looking at? Is this a mid round prospect, a late round prospect, another early? This guy is a sort of early mid round guy. His, he is Royce Freeman out of Oregon. He is five foot eleven and two hundred twenty nine pounds. Uh, Freeman was a top recruit coming out of California as an all state running back with two thousand eight hundred twenty four yards and a whopping four to one touchdown. He contributed for the Ducks as soon as he stepped on the team. As a true freshman, he started eleven games and uh, was named the Pac twelve Offensive Rookie of the Year as well as a freshman All American with one thousand three hundred sixty five yards and eighteen touchdowns on the ground as well as an additional 16 receptions for 158 yards and a touchdown through the air. In his next season, he did even better, earning uh, first-team all-pack 12 honors with uh, 1,826 rushing yards, 17 touchdowns, 26 receptions for 348 yards, and two receiving touchdowns. However, in 2016, Freeman collapsed with his team as they went 4-8. and eight. He only got to 945 yard yards and scored only nine times, seven of which were in the first five games. This was in part because he suffered a knee injury that definitely restricted the explosiveness he had had in previous years, but still ended up becoming the Ducks' leading rusher anyway. So physically, Freeman has a really impressive muscular frame, if you couldn't tell from the picture on the screen, and that helps him in a, a few ways. First, he uses his upper body strength to shake off tacklers who come uh, up too high. Second, he uses the power in his, uh, in his lead shoulder uh, when challenging safeties in the open field. Then last but not least, his build produces some natural power and gives him contact balance when he's at a higher play speed. But uh, speaking of his speed, he knows when to accelerate when uh, following washdown blocks. Basically, he knows how to work through the mess. Despite being a pretty big guy, he's actually pretty elusive. He has quality footwork and directional change, and he contorts to the shape of the run lane to squeeze through holes, holes that he finds because he also has pretty good ball carry vision. He's been a dependable and productive back when he's been called to step up, and he could become a third down back if he improves his pass protection. Finally, despite not really producing as a receiver and mostly being used on screens, he has some pretty good hands. Uh, I think my main concern with him, though, is that he doesn't always play to his size. He has a big frame and muscular build, yet would rather eat contact than dish out a hit into someone trying to, uh, trying to tackle him. Next up, both arm tackles and leg tackles mess him up. Arm tackles have proven to slow him, and he plays with a hip tightness that prevents him from slipping out of those leg tackles on the perimeter. At his time at Oregon, he's uh, been run into the ground quite a bit, getting over a thousand touches, and it has seemingly worn down his acceleration, that and the injuries. 
Because of his worn down acceleration, he really lacks that explosive getaway speed. Another problem he has is that he sometimes looks like he's anticipating contact when attacking run freezes, and that's an issue. Despite me praising his elusiveness also, for the most part, uh, in the positives, when it comes to defenders closing in on him in the open field, his elusiveness is just average. Finally, his jump cuts are nothing spectacular, often getting limited ground. First uh, play style, Freeman has earned comparisons to Texans running back uh, Deontay Foreman. But for me, I see more of Jonathan Stewart. Uh, type guy when I see Freeman. Just the, the way he's got a powerful frame that could straight up, that could run straight up in the middle while also being able to catch. That it made me think of Jonathan Stewart more than anything. I'm watching when I'm watching his highlights. If he can, uh, if he declared for the draft following his sophomore season, he would have easily gone in the first round with Ezekiel Elliott, if not very early in the second round. But with the injuries and how much he's been used over the two over the past two uh, years, uh, I'm sorry, over the two years following his sophomore season have had all scouts concerned about if he could last in the NFL. Because of this, he's being mocked mostly somewhere between the third and fourth round. So, like I said earlier in in the mid-round, as as some teams think he's going to be undercredited and still could be uh, – and being undercredited and still could be as good as he was in the, his sophomore season. So that is Royce Freeman out of Oregon. Who is your second prospect? My second prospect is Chase Edmonds out of uh, the small school Fordham University. Uh, at only five foot nine and 205 pounds, Edmonds was actually one of the most successful running backs in college football history. He finished with just under 6,000 career rushing yards, and despite all of his success, he was never considered an attractive option because of his lack of size and speed at high school. He actually faced a lot of racism in high school too, but uh, as a former uh, all team, sorry team, sorry. All Pennsylvania team pick in 2013 and the MVP of the Big 33 All Star Game, which is the game between uh, the best high school players in Ohio versus Pennsylvania. <clears throat> he was named the Freshman of the Year in Division One FCS football in 2014 after he started all 14 games and set a career high, uh, which would have been, which ended up being his career high in rushing yards with 18 sorry 1,838 yards and 23 touchdowns while contributing as a receiver and returner as well. He was also named a second-team All-American in 2015 with six, sorry, 1,648 yards and 20 more touchdowns on the ground, while he added five more through the air. And then he built on that with another great season in his junior year with 1,799 yards and 19 touchdowns in 2016, and he set an FCS record by averaging 21 yards a carry against Lafayette in 2017. Uh... Or sorry, yeah, 2016 uh, in a game where he had 17 carries for 359 yards. Sadly for him, leg injuries forced him to miss all but seven games in his senior season, where he still managed to run for 577 yards, but the injuries likely cost him a shot at the all-time FCS rushing record, which is held by Adrian, Peter Adrian Peterson. Sorry, It's not the Adrian Peterson you're thinking of either. There was another Adrian Peterson who played about eight or nine years for the Bears in the early to mid 2000s. So that's the Peterson uh, that holds the record in FCS. So as far as strengths about Edmonds, the first things the first thing that jumps out to you about him is his production. And every season besides his senior season, he was productive. And despite the injuries he sustained, he had been durable before that and has a thick lower body on a smaller frame. He has natural hip movement and stays square to the line of scrimmage when he's running uh, laterally. Uh, he becomes more compact as well in order to make cuts when he has to, and he's acrobatic when he makes twists and can change direction quickly to make defenders miss. He knows he's small and he runs with a good bend with a wide base to make sure it's a little harder to tackle him than it should be. He has a powerful opening stride that helps him get up to speed faster than most, and he's not super fast, but he's still fast enough to get the corner against a team that doesn't set the edge properly. He's powerful enough to break arm tackles and showed surprising strength, too. He was a good receiver in space. Even though he's a raw route runner, he can catch the ball. Uh, his weaknesses, though, obviously, as is going to be the case with the other backs, like I mentioned, size is the issue for Edmonds. It doesn't seem as though there can be any more weight added to what he currently has on his frame. And then the injuries he suffered last year are concerning. Teams are going to have to wonder if he's starting to break down after receiving a huge workload for over three years at Fordham. 
He also lacks decisiveness on inside runs, which could become worse as he has to stare down big defensive linemen at the NFL level. He doesn't have a great feel for blocking schemes and isn't patient when he should be, and by the same token, he's too patient when he needs to move. He tries to bounce runs outside far too often that have failed on the inside, which usually results in more yards lost. Edmonds is not an instinctive runner on the second level, and therefore plays that should have been touchdowns or longer gains ended a lot sooner. He doesn't have a great juke move er either, which he loves to try to keep using, and uh, he's better served running around linebackers as opposed to trying to make them miss. His pass protection leaves a lot to be desired at this point in his career, but it's also unlikely to change much given his uh, current size. So bottom line, Chase Edmonds had a fantastic and decorated college career, which he should be proud of, uh, and he is where he needs to be with his frame, so that's good. Uh, his good agility will help him, but despite being a good athlete, there's going to be a lot of questions about the way he played against a uh, lower level of competition and his size. And he needs to play with a more consistent pace of play at the line of scrimmage, uh, along with uh, more decisiveness at the line as well, in order to be an NFL player. He could fit in as a scat back in a by-committee approach like I've been kind of pushing, but his running is likely to be limited to plays on the outside. So he's going to be a late-round pick and possibly even a UDFA. So uh, keep your eyes out on him as someone the Steelers might bring in if he's not drafted. Uh, otherwise, he's probably not going to be much more than a third down back. Who's your third and final running back prospect, Austin? My final prospect is Kyle Hicks out of TCU. He is five foot ten and 204 pounds. Hicks came out of high school as one of the top running back prospects in Texas, getting offers from everywhere to play football. He could have literally went anywhere, but he decided on TCU. It wasn't until 2016 that he was able to showcase his talent. He was an honorable mention All-Big 12 pick that year, amassing uh, 1,042 rushing yards on 203 carries and adding 12 touchdowns, five of them coming in the game against Baylor. Uh, he also tacked on 13 receptions for 104 yards and a touchdown. And then in, 20, in 2017, he didn't have such a good year. He was arrested for public intoxication at a Whataburger restaurant near campus, but still managed to start 11 of 13 games played. He split his carries with Darius Anderson and still got 139 carries that covered 637 yards, had four rushing touchdowns, but still went huge as a receiver, getting 30 receptions for 291 yards and a touchdown. So what I like, without a doubt, my favorite thing about him is his agility. His feet are just so nimble and sudden. He makes these nasty cuts because his lateral agil agility is solid. He's also got a decent speed to him, at least enough to get around the corners, and uh, his play speed is consistent, which is good. When necessary, he can bounce from, a gap, bounce from gap to gap and try to get into open space. And he also has solid elusiveness. He can elude an initial attacker, but doesn't get too cute with it. Then he has shown uh, that he has the ability to absorb and balance through lower body contact like it's nothing. Uh, another great thing about him is in 444 career carries, he only has fumbled twice. He really just knows how to take care of the football. And then finally, he's a dangerous receiving threat. He gained 77 catches over the past two seasons. Uh, on the other side of things, Hicks isn't really good at letting his blocks develop. He rushes his outside zone carries, and fails to set, uh, set up the backside cuts. Really, it comes down to him lacking patience. And I don't know whether that's the cause of his lack of ball carry vision or if his lack of ball carry vision causes the lack of patience. Regardless, he has a lack of patience and lack of ball carry vision, for that matter. The most concerning stat of all is his yards after contact. He lets arms tackle slow his momentum greatly, and because of that, in the last two seasons, he only had five yards after contact. Yes. Only five. Another issue is while he was pretty, he has a pretty solid size, he doesn't use it to his advantage. He's not really a, a tough runner and just lacks the leg drive to re reliably get the tougher yards. He doesn't really have top end speed either. He's actually one of the slower backs coming from this draft. Uh, then finally, he's not a huge play guy, only getting having one carry go for more than 27 yards all of last season. But, uh, most scouts are basing their analysis on his pass catching abilities as he's one of the top pass catchers in this draft, despite possibly going undrafted. He's just really not good at breaking tackles. It's just really holding him back. Those five yards after contact is a disgusting stat, and it's hard to swallow. I think Hicks actually might have a chance at switching position and becoming a receiver instead, as he actually looks to have better skills as a receiver right now. But 
still he is slower for either position, whether it be running back or wide receiver. As it is, Hicks is being predicted to go undrafted, but I really think he's going to be drafted around seven. His pass catching abilities are just too good to not use uh, such a late round pick on him. I can't see him going undrafted, even though uh, anal- analysis are saying they are. So that is Kyle Hicks out of TCU. Alrighty, very interesting. Uh, my last prospect is Rock Thomas, an interesting name, out of Jacksonville State, which I just learned today, Austin, is not in Jacksonville, Florida. Do you have any idea where that is? Jacksonville uh, State? No, no idea where Jacksonville State is. Where is it? It's in Alabama, actually. Quite interesting. interesting. That's weird that Jacksonville State is not... Well, I, maybe there's a, I guess that town is called Jacksonville, just Jacksonville, Alabama. Yes. Like my, Miami University of Ohio. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, it's it's one of those interesting things that you uh, kind of stumble upon when you're seeing these uh, these players at these smaller schools. I'm kind of glad I uh, got a chance to learn it though. Uh, but in any case, uh, Thomas Rock Thomas, the five foot eleven, one hundred ninety three pounder. Uh, he was a highly sought after running back after being named Alabama's Player of the Year award uh, after winning the Alabama's Player of the Year award in his senior year of football. That season, he had, oh, listen to this, 2,211 rushing yards, and he scored 32 touchdowns. That earned him a scholarship at Auburn, where he contributed immediately as a freshman, rushing 43 times for 214 yards and two touchdowns as a freshman in 2014. Uh, But injuries slowed him down in 2015, where he put up very similar numbers, despite playing more in the offense. He ran for exactly 43, uh, 43 more times again, for 261 yards and a single touchdown on the ground. He knew that the next season his playing time was going to continue to diminish, so he decided to transfer to Jacksonville State. And despite only starting in four of nine games that year, he still earned first-team All-Ohio Valley Conference honors with 782 rushing yards and seven touchdowns. He took over as the full-time starter last year, where he ran for 1,065 yards and scored 13 touchdowns. He also caught 21 passes for 244 yards and was named a second-team All-American. So, Thomas's strengths. As a former five-star prospect, Thomas has a good frame for a speedy back, and despite being under 200 pounds, he runs with a good charge in his lower body. He has a good jump cut, and he uses it well in conjunction with other cuts well, too. He has good vision and foot quickness to get to a hole quickly, and Thomas has great balance as he runs through the hole oftentimes letting him fall forward as opposed to being knocked back or sideways by defenders in the hole. Even though he's a strong and committed downhill runner, he will keep his head up too, and that allows him the opportunity opportunity to make small moves or to break a tackle here or there while he's running downhill. And even though he wasn't asked to contribute in the passing game very often, he showed that he can do that job well. He actually made several diving catches as a receiver as well, so that's something to keep your eyes on. Uh, As far as his negatives, though, he's only 193 pounds, but he looks and plays like he's heavier than that. His vision looks good at times, but other times it completely disappears, and he makes some questionable decisions when he has to pick a hole. Sometimes Thomas will actually just give up on a play too early, and he'll just try to run up his lineman's back, which I can tell you from first-hand experience, that's something that linemen absolutely hate. Instead of waiting for a hole develop, the running back will run up your back, I, that that's one of the most painful things that can happen because you're not waiting for it, Austin, and all of a sudden, wham, you're getting, like, it's like someone just immediately just runs into you out of nowhere, and you're just, you're not expecting it, but they're wearing pads, too, so that's always fun, and yes, it usually pushes you forward, but sometimes it, it's at a cost of uh, significant back pain, and in any case, uh, Thomas will look for the big play too often as well instead of taking what the defense will give him. This costs him some extra positive yardage in crucial situations. He doesn't run his feet through all contact, making him easier to bring down uh, than he should be after originally making contact. He also doesn't show great effort in pass protection at all. So bottom line, Thomas is an interesting back who has the potential to be a change of pace player, and he has good athleticism and agility, But at the same time, he's too willing to try to bust every play for a touchdown. He needs to be more patient and disciplined as a running back to get more playing time. He does run with great burst and has good elusiveness, but he lacks consistency in his game. 
He needs some more coaching, but he will be an attractive option for teams that look to take a flyer on a back late in the draft. It's also interesting to note that in his NFL.com draft profile page, he was compared to uh, rookie running back last year, Elijah McGuire of the New York Jets, who was actually a running back I looked at uh, as a potential third down guy last season. So uh, I think that's a favorable comparison. All right, Austin, now that we've looked at all of our prospects, uh, why don't you rank your uh, prospects based on how much you'd like to see them end up with the Steelers? My first one, before I actually say it, I this is another tough one to, for me. Tight ends is still tougher, but this, I, this one took some thinking on how I wanted to move it around. But the first one is going to be Royce Freeman out of Oregon. I like him as one of the starting members of the Steelers running back committee following Le'Veon Bell. I even trust him as a starting back if it's just him and for him to possibly be available. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I like him as a starting back and uh, Connor backing him up. And it's just, if, if he's there in round four, that sounds like a good deal to me. I think that's a good budget pick. And I think Royce Freeman might be one of the best uh, running backs out of this uh, draft. I truly believe that based on, his skill set, if he literally can return to his uh, sophomore season form, that's putting a, a lot of, that's betting, and I, I have said in the past, I don't like betting on the player's past, but I think he can if he just puts in the work. So I really have a, a, a lot of hope for Royce Freeman. Second was Kyle Hicks. Almost got ranked first because he will also be a great part of a committee. Since Connor isn't the greatest pass catching back, Hicks could be that, and he also seems to be average in pass protection where he would be better than Connor as well. So this guy does end up going in the draft. I think he would be a good guy to bring in because he has the pass catching ability that you you need and he could pass protect, which Connor really can't do either. He's not that good at either because of his size. But then that leaves guys. I really wanted to like him, but his tape left me wanting more. I was unimpressed for the round he's projected to go. I was watching his tape and while in, uh, Hicks only had one uh, play go for more than 27 yards last season, Darius guys just didn't really seem to get big play, uh, big plays either. He averaged seven point six yards a carry, but and that's really good because he did it reliably by getting like eight yards every rush he had. But like he doesn't, I haven't really seen that many big plays I want out of a first potential first round draft pick. I, I just wasn't a fan. I really wanted to like him for his story, but I, if the Steelers pick him round one, I'm going to be upset. I I, I, I am going to say I will be really upset where. Before this, I was thinking I'm, I might like it. it may, in a crazy scenario, I might like it. But that's how I rank my prospects. Uh, how do you rank yours? Well, I've already mentioned this to you, so you already know. But Akram Wadley was my favorite running back in this draft class uh, as far as who I think he could end up uh, – is most likely to end up with Pittsburgh. He's a guy that's closest to being able to do it all as a third down back than the other two backs that I looked at. And Wadley showed an ability to run and break plays for long uh, long gains. He can catch the ball. He just needs to be a little more refined. And he showed better than the other two prospects I looked at that he actually can pass protect. And that's something that the Steelers are going to ask their third down back to do. So it's something that you better be good at. And even though he's undersized, he showed that he can do it. So if he becomes more willing, maybe packs on a little more weight, I think he'd be a, the perfect third down back option. Uh, it's a, just a question now of whether or not he'll be available in the middle rounds when the Steelers are likely looking at running backs. But I'd be very happy to pick him up. Uh, second, this one was kind of tough, uh, ranking the last two, but I decided to go with Rock Thomas. And the ultimate, uh, I guess, deciding factor was the fact that Thomas got compared to McGuire from last year, who was a player I looked at that I really liked. And beyond that, Chase Edmonds, I just – sometimes I have trouble, I guess, kind of trusting whether players are going to be as good as they were in college, especially when they played at a lower-level college. And then beyond that, he had so many touches, and then just this past year he had injury concerns, uh, Chase Edmonds did. So I'm a little concerned about that, and I – I just I believe a little more in Thomas at this point, but Thomas and Edmonds are more late round picks, and Wadley is a middle round pick. So I'd love to see the Steelers end up with Wadley, but uh, if not, I think Thomas or Edmonds would be great late round picks or uh, undrafted free agents as well. So either way, we got a good amount of running backs here covered for you. Uh, let us know what you think. Who do you want to see the Steelers take if they take a running back? Do you want them to take? 
a future starter, or do you want to see them take kind of a rotational piece? How should the Steelers assemble their running back uh, group next year? Uh, time will tell, but uh, for now, Austin, uh, we're going to wrap things up for tonight, unless if you had anything else you wanted to say. Nope, this should be it for me. All righty. We are cl- uh, quickly getting close to the end of our uh, off-season draft previews. We only have three more position groups left to check out. Uh, next, we'll be doing the edge rushers slash outside linebackers. So uh, stay tuned for that. But for the time being, if you have any questions about the show, feel free to email us at tra- stronger than steel podcast at gmail.com. Check us out on Twitter at stronger underscore steel and Instagram at stronger underscore steel underscore NFL. Uh, we're also on Facebook. We post our episodes on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. So check them out. Check our show out there. And uh, check out our website, StrongerThanSteelNFL.Blogspot.com. Austin, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Ladies and gentlemen of Steeler Nation, thanks for listening tonight. And uh, as always, thank you for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Have a good night. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And don't forget to check out our 